Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. With us today, we have first-time guest, a very special guest, Jackson Moorhead, who was the security chief at the Int base of Church of Scientology in San Jacinto, California. Jackson, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. The base is about 550 acres. It's an old uh, golf course resort that uh, the Church of Scientology purchased when uh, R.N. Harvard was alive, and then you slowly turn it into uh, the base. Yes. I mean, how, do, how does it become a religious compound? Well, it, there was a transitional stage that initially from the, the late 70s when the property was purchased and staff were put there, in its formative stages, when all the buildings were still pink and, and pretty much the whole property looked like a genuine hot springs resort. Um, in the 80, in 82 onward, from 82 to 86, there, there was a great transition of the property from uh, initially we painted the buildings white walls with blue roofs to make it look like a Scottish, have a Scottish colored theme. Yeah. Uh, no, no, tra tra no transformation occurred with the buildings themselves. It was just everything was painted from pink to uh, to the white and blue, white buildings with blue roofs. Um, and I was involved with that pretty heavily. Of uh, special paint was purchased for the roofs. You know the 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 shore story, which was basically the term used to what we tell the public or any inquiring mind as to what this place is all about, was. Uh, simply that there was a retired rich investor who invested in the property, and we are, are the caretakers of the property. And that really? was it. There was no mention of filmmaking or nothing. No, definitely, we are definitely, certainly instructed to not mention anything about Church of Scientology whatsoever. It was about a, simply a man who purchased the property, and we are the caretakers. Uh, so after Battlefield Earth, timeline-wise, uh, is when... A big shift in attention went towards base, getting base security established. And Kenny Siebold and Matt Pesh and Jim Cup were the original uniformed security guards at the base. I think Matt was the security chief, Kenny was the deputy, and Jim Cup was a security, you know, watch chief, or something like that. Anyways, um, they they had they worked hard on on picking people from the base crew as to who's going to be in security and this basically force-fed order occurred where whoever was selected you're going to be in security and I had to go through a round of sec checks to make sure that I wasn't a plant and all that and so on and so forth even though I'd already been through clearance lines to be at the base I had to go through another round um, and once I was selected I was posted in security and given a uniform and we had you know, radios and all this kind of stuff. And Rick Asneran was overseeing its operation. And that was a whirlwind of activity, believe me. One thing that uh, I, I think our listeners would like to hear about, there's there's questions about the uh, imp base and guns. Are there guns out at Scientology's there imp base? There are guns, but nothing compared to the the, the, the folklore that's been generated out in the public world. Um, is is you know to those stories. There's no heavy artillery, no high powered this and that's and armed guards and all that. Um, okay, so basically, when the security force was being established, Rick Asdran was in charge of it. Somehow, he convinced people all the way up to LRH that we we were we were going to have guns. Now, L. Ron Hubbard himself, there was a specific LRH advice I remember that clearly stated he did not want people carrying guns. Guns end up leaving bodies laying around. Correct, yeah. Um, so. And so we were not trained to carry guns, but Rick Asdran did purchase, uh, I think there were six or eight 12 gauge shotguns and eight to 10 uh, 45 handheld pistols. And. Uh, uh, of which all were kept down in the security office in these display type <coughs> gun safes. Um, right. And uh, that was the extent of it. We obviously had the ammunition that went with each gun. We had buckshot and slug shots for the 12 gauges, and we had uh, hollow point and and round point ammunition for the 45s. And no, none of the guards were issued holsters 
shooters or none of that. We just had guns that just had the 12 gauges in that. And now we also had uh, two H and K 91s. Why we had those and where those came from, I don't know, but I'm pretty certain that that was Rick Asnarian's doing. But we had two of those. Now those are for for the audience. Those are assault rifles. Yeah, those are high powered 308 assault rifles. They had little tripods on on the front end barrel that basically you could uh, kick the tripod open and lay prone on the ground and have a stabilized shot. So. Why we had those, I don't know, but we sure trained on their use, and we used to go up to the uh, impromptu gun range, shooting range up behind Bonnie View, and uh, practice on shooting of their use into sandbags. And um, uh, the, the, the HK 91s, we sure had a lot of fun with. I'll, I'll never forget how many clips I went through of, I would stand there with the gun at my hip, <laughs> like in Rambo, and just try to empty a clip as much as I could at the very top of the mountain and just watch the puffs of dust, the dust clouds that would happen at the, all the way at the top of the mountain. It was so impressive. It's like, oh, my God, this thing's powerful. So um, we used to get crew training, just target shooting practice, familiarity with the gun, taking them apart and all that. Rick Asran saw to it that we did that. Um, and, in fact, it was training on those that led to my demise of going to the RPF, but that's for a later story. Um, but at no time up until I left in 97 um, were, did those guns serve a purpose other than being a last line of defense. Uh, what about eagles now, uh, well, the, the, the lookout? What? Okay, now there's other folklore out there about being a sniper, it being a sniper's position. Never at any time in the history that I was there uh, or in charge of security was that, that uh, location established as a sniper point, nor was there any sniper rifles up there um although we did have a sniper rifle that is true because i saw to its purchase um at the direction of our pi jj gaw um once i sold the h and k 91s because those, those became illegal to possess in california i sold them to some gentleman in texas um we turned around and at jj's suggestion which was approved by rtc that we have a sniper rifle for a last line of defense to sit comfortably wherever we choose to defend ourselves and pick things, pick people off. I say things and I don't like saying picking people off, but basically that's what it was for. We weren't going to try to, you know, shoot the stems off of long flowers at a distance um, or, or bottles for entertainment purposes. That sniper rifle was designed to be able to, um, be the high quality professional tool that it was designed to be to pluck off ad adversaries coming to um, take over Scientology, basically. And uh, well, yeah, just for the I mean, just for the sake of talking, if you had an armed intruder on the base, some some local with a gun. Yeah. I mean, you, there is a legitimate reason for yes. self defense yes. of, of a facility, so no one's no one's going to gain say that. Were there procedures in place in the event of a raid, yes. say, by the FBI? Yes, yes. INCOM, INCOM had its little drill set up to dump all the computers. Um, Dave had his escape routes. Yeah, all sorts of things were were established. Shredders in place. Were there, were there code words in the event of a raid? No, Did you call like No, no. no. Uh, you know, you mentioned code words. I do remember some sort of thing about talking about that on the phone. If we had to talk on the phone, there were code words. But... Um, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a big, big, big deal that everybody knew what the drill was, and we drilled on it. It just there was there was a plan, a plan in place for that in the back of your mind concern. And I guess our legal lines would be the ones that determine whether it was going to happen or not. But well, going back to the uh, to the eagle's nest. What is the eagle's nest? Is it just a look okay. out of the base? Now, the eagle eagle is what. Myself and Eric Ergens called it because it puts you in a position, this, this bird's eye view of the property. And we needed, we, we function on radio codes, so uh, we knew that handheld radios could be uh, uh, listened in on through handheld scanners and stuff. So we had a code for um, objects and identities of concern that we didn't want people to know about. And Eagle became the name of that security position. Now, Eric Ergens, on his own accord, would hike up in the foothills up behind Bonnie View when he was on watch. And um, the higher up the hill, the better the position got. Now, we originally had one. The first eagle was 
was lower on the mountain and further to the uh, further to the east behind Bonnie View, and then uh, Eric went wandering up up behind the, the shooting range and went up to where you know it to be today, and that's we discovered it there, and and um, it gave us great vantage. It was a great vantage point of the property. You can see all points and all buildings and the entire perimeter, and and um, it just be came established then. Um, Kirsten, Kirsten, um, uh, I forget his last name. Anyways, my security systems engineer, um, he went up there uh, on his own accord. He was on watch one night, and he, on his own, he decided to dig a hole to seek refuse into a cooler environment because it was so hot up there. Um, and <laughs> it was kind of a funny situation in that Eagle, we purposely had a walking path up to it, so you couldn't see it up the face of the hill from a distance. Um, and Karsten, his name was Karsten, actually. Um, Karsten dug this hole out and shoveled all the dirt over down the face of the mountain, and it just uh, acted like this big arrow that pointed right back to where the hole was. Yeah. So Karsten was forced the next night to stay up all night, and he transplanted bushes and weeds off the hillside onto this newly exposed earth to hide it and that that never worked but uh that was a sorry memory i remember how carson was upset at himself he thought he did something good and it turned out to be a big 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 flap and kenny siebold was extremely pissed and anyway so eagle being basically eagle was born there and um it, it, it evolved into how to keep the guard sheltered, how to keep the guard warm. Um, many and many a nights I spent up there and many guards spent up there freezing our butts off um, or getting burnt by the sun. Um, hot and windy or cold and windy. It, it was never a happy, oh, wow, what a nice evening <laughs> this is up here. I used to sit up and watch in my underwear. It, oh, because of the Because heat. it was so hot. Literally, I would strip, I'd get up there and just strip down to my underwear. In the you know, no, I've, I I lived in the desert for a long time, for many many years, and and uh, it is it can be a very brutal, unforgiving uh, oh, climate. Oh, geez, geez, Louise, that's an understatement. Yes, especially yeah, when you're up there for uh, twelve or sixteen hour days, which was quite routine. Yeah, the desert freezes in the winter. It can get uh, one time out when I lived in uh, Antelope Valley. I, I woke up one morning; it was two degrees. Oh. I thought, how can it be? How can it be two degrees? And it could get as high as 116, 117 yeah. in the summer. Uh, now, there's a there's another bit of urban legend, myth, folklore I want to clear up. There, a story circulated online that one of the people on the lookout at Eagle pointed a sniper rifle oh, at David Miscavige. Yeah. Let's, okay. Can you clear that up okay. for us? What okay. happened? Yes. That all ties back to the staff member named Kevin Post. <laughs> Kevin Poston was one of my guards, nicest guy in the world, really, really cool. His, his father was a CHP officer. He was Kevin is really a gentle soul, um, but he didn't have much of a backbone as a person, so he was able to be walked on easily. And I, I give that as a backstory to his character of how things went south for him. Um, uh, sometime in the early 80s, early to mid 80s, or 90s, um, one Sunday morning, uh, uh, I, I was part of a, I was a volunteer firefighter with, with the county state fire with the local station out there. So I had my little pager and my tie-ins with the fire department and all that. So one Sunday morning, I lived out, uh, out near the Mount San Ysidro College and off Quant Ranch Road. Um, and my pager goes off that there was a fire at 19625 Highway 79. I was like, what the hell, what, what the heck? <laughs> So I get on for your base. Yeah, that, that yeah. was my home. That was my home address. So I, uh, I walk outside my house. I get on my radio. I'm like, you know, you know, I call back to the booth. I'm like, what's happening? You see, yeah, there's a fire up in the hill. I look back and I could see the column of smoke, uh, what's called a header, which is the column of smoke going up and hitting this inversion layer. Um, actually it was above the inversion layer. So it wasn't given the typical signs. I'm like, wow, look at that. That thing's, it, you know, it's, it's, just it, it's burning really well but how so high up on the hill what happened um okay so long story short i get back i get up to the base and um to the booth and i find out that kevin poston up there at the towards the end of his shift i mean he was probably within 30 15 minutes of getting off shift he had to relieve himself so 
So he hiked up above Eagle a little bit, made a little clearing, did his business, signed his paperwork, and he he decided to burn that paperwork. Oh, and for boy. whatever reason, what what where where the logic was uh, led to him doing it, I don't know, but maybe he did it a hundred times before and nothing ever happened. But this time, because of where he was up on the hill on that time of day, the inversion layer, the the, the atmospheric separation between warmer and cooler air in the morning you have the yeah. cooler air below and you have, and the warmer air is above well he was just above that so the the environmental conditions were different where he was and it was much warmer and it was windier so he signed his paperwork he decides to light it and um off into the brush it takes and uh at his great shock, he tries to do all he can to try to, to, to snuff that fire out, and he takes, rips his uniform shirt off, which has still had his badge on it, and tries to beat it out, and that was unsuccessful. It just kept spreading and, and so on, and then we resultingly had a fire. Um, and that resulted in a big full state wildland response, helicopters, hand crews, engines, bulldozers, you name it, because this is in the middle of the summer. So the fire, I mean, you're you're a, a fireman, yeah. Jackson. I mean, a wildfire, I guess it can spread out. Oh yeah, well instantly. especially in a well. It was Just, a well marked, well known high high risk fire zone. So you have a big raging fire with a full response. A full wildland response. Yeah, it wasn't a big rager. I mean, there was no structure threat. It was burning uphill. I mean, give me a break. It was so blown out of proportion in the in respect to, you know, the church executives that were there and our own staff. <clears throat> when it comes to the fire department, it's like, oh, there's a fire up in the hill. It's burning up slope. There's no structure threat. You know, it's more more of a you know preserving the wildland. Um, sure, but you know, people people who are not fire fighters who are not professionals. Right. They'll go, oh, my God, a yeah. fire. It's a giant fire. And, you know, they'll run around, and that's why you need professionals yeah. to handle it. So the fire gets handled. What's the aftermath of the well, fire? It, it, it basically, the crews were out there the entire day. You know, they're dipping out of our, our uh, out of our lakes for, you know, the airship water source and so forth. Yeah. Um, it, it was a full-day affair. Um, but Kevin Poston was subsequently investigated. Now, Initially, in the in the early stages of the what went wrong and how are we going to handle this on a PR front, um, I was sitting up at Eagle. I went up there myself to look, and I, I found Kevin Poston's what was excuse me what was left of his melted shirt, and ironically his badge, his badge was laying face down on the ground around all these charred ground. I picked it up, and funny enough, picking up his badge uh, exposed this. Uh, unburnt section of weeds. I mean, you know, as a badge is a as big as a badge you have on your chest. Yeah. It, it it protected the ground. So there was this little star shape in the weeds of unburnt weeds. It was pretty pretty funny. But you, you know, I could have taken the evidence away, but then that would have left behind an uh, imprint on the ground of oh, there was obviously a star shaped badge here. Uh, yeah. Anyways, so I'm up there trying to figure out, you know, what, how this happened, what's going to happen. Now we have this attention on the Eagle booth, which we always kind of kept low profile, and we did not want in the public eye is is to what's going on up there. The, the, the shorter story for Eagle booth and everybody outside the perimeter was it was a fire watch. So that the funny thing was to say that that was a fire watch. Um, well, that fire watch was a source of the fire happening on the hill, so we couldn't use that. I was on the phone. I was on a conference call with Ken Hoden, Dave Miscavige, Mark uh, Ingber, and Mark Yeager. And I'm sitting up there in the Eagle booth, and I am having this conference call on the speaker box and being asked, how am I going to solve this? So Ken Hoden yeah. was giving his little weak suggestions, and, I, you know, and I'm like, Ken, shut up. We cannot lie. We cannot lie. Lying is going to lead down a path of misery, and I know these folks. I know the the fire investigator that's coming out. I know everybody, and truly, I knew everybody that was going to be responding by first name. You know, I just knew them. I fought a fire with them, so I knew how the system worked. So the best thing is to be honest, and the honesty is one of our staff messed up, and uh, you know we're going to deal with it in house. And um, you know, typically the acceptable thing is he's most likely going to lose his job. So the church paid the costs of fighting the fire. Well, yeah, that's what it eventually resulted in. But I, I had this this verbal, you know, 
I had to keep overriding these suggestions to to not tell the truth. You know, something else, something else. You know, what are you going to do, Jackson? What are you going to do? I'll just never forget those echoing commands coming into that phone from all these people on the phone. And I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell them the truth, and the investigator's going to be here any minute. So the guy ends up coming up up the hill. He hiked all the way up and started poking around, and I was showing him this, showing him that. I, I basically did his work for him and showed him where everything was. And I had to steer his attention away from looking into the Eagle booth, the details, the, that there was power there, the whole nine yards. So, You mean, you mean there was... Uh, uh Electricity oh, yeah. going up. Yeah, we illegally ran elect electricity up to that booth. There was no no uh, proper installation of it. Martin Reed ran this big heavy duty basically extension cord up up the east side face of that hill into the booth and I had electricity up there to power a heater and our battery chargers and stuff like that. Yeah, all all unpermitted stuff. Yeah. Uh so so the the fire investigation proceeds. Uh, yeah. And then then how does Ke what it happens next? I mean, how does so what happens next to Kevin Post? Later on that day, when all the excitement settled down from the fire in the hill, um, Kevin Poston was down in HCO, um, you know, the ethics department, writing up his OWs. You know, he was basically sent straight to. You know, he was still to be sleeping. He should have. This guy had been up all day, and he's still down there. So he's now writing up his. Overts and withholds, which is typically the first thing that anybody's sent to do that gets in serious trouble. That's the first thing they have to they get marched to do is go write up your OWs, just as a happy way means of what am I going to do with this guy? Well, make him write up his OWs so I'll figure out what he's going to do. So that's what Kevin Poston was doing all day was sitting there writing up his his life wrongdoings. Um, Liz Ingber comes to see me. She was a CEO of Gold at the time and quite upset and wondering, what am I doing about this? So I told her the whole story. Um, she wanted to know what crimes Kevin Poston had and uh, so on and so forth. And she said he needs to go to the RPF. And I, I was really upset by that. And I said, I don't know if that's wavered or not. I can see that it is, but... I don't think that he qualifies for it. He's going, he's going. He was basically at that point established as the fall guy for the whole thing. So, I mean, he was. I mean, he was a source of it. Don't get me wrong. But to to simmer the whole thing down, the solution was Kevin Post is going to the RPF. Okay, good. That's handled. You know, people at the end base, once you knew that somebody was being shot, everything went back to normal. The ripples in the, in the wave, the waves turned into ripples and it turned into a mill pond again once you established that there was somebody to shoot they've been shot and they're they they are now at the rpf so we would move okay, on we have a head on a yeah, bike that's right and it was kevin poston so as a result from that kevin poston was heavily sec checked and in the course of the sec check he basically you know you know they're going to ask questions about severe crime Crimes, evil intentions, this is and that. So, however, I wasn't in a sec check at the time, but what resulted out of it was a report that Kevin Poston watched Dave Miscavige through the scope in the rifle, uh, the, the sniper rifle, and followed him around the pro property. And then Dave saw that report and, and took it as, oh, see, there are people trying to kill me. See, there are people trying to kill me. And that changed Kevin Poston's life forever. What really happened was it came up in his sec check was that Dave, uh, Kevin Poston was up at Eagle and with our high powered uh, 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 binoculars, we had binoculars and a monoscope up there that you could basically from Eagle read a book out in the riverbed. And, you know, if somebody were holding a book, you could yeah. read the title on the book. It, it was that good. So I used to drill my, have my guards drill on following objects. So if, so they, they wouldn't lose them from up there. Um, anyways, Kevin Poston ran well, across let, let Dave. Me, Go ahead. No, let, yeah, let me interject. I, for a people who never used high power binoculars, it's you can't just pick them up and use them. You have to train your eyes exactly. to use them. Exactly. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to use high power binoculars. And anyone who's tried to watch a sporting event will know you don't. If you're watching a football game, it's not going to work unless you have some prior experience following. That's exactly. It. So. So Kevin Poston is training his eye by following David Miscavige with a pair of binoculars. Well, he's, he's just following various people on the property, and then he discovers, oh, look at that, there's COB in, in his field of view. 
So he, you know, he's just doing, he's, he's just following him around. No biggie. He's not like trying to watch yeah, so, him and see, you know, whatever. So how does it get morphed in the sec check into he has a high power? It gets morphed by David Scavage. That see, that's that's that some bitch trying to keep an eye on me and trying to kill me. <laughs> oh, Lord yeah, have exactly. mercy. Exactly. That... Those words out of you know the Golden God, the the Pope of Scientology's mouth means that Kevin Poston is the biggest enemy. So Kevin Poston's life gets turned into hell. I mean, it was already hell. It was just somebody turned up the, the turned it up a notch. And he basically uh, was considered a psychotic, you know, in the church church language, a type three uh, evil murderer. And he was trying to, and Kevin Poston was forever labeled as the one wanting, truly intending to kill COB. And he actually had him in the crosshairs on her sniper rifle. Well, the sniper rifle was never an eagle, so <laughs> he could never have done that. There is no sniper rifle in the world that has such a field of view that you could look at such a distance, I mean, over, I mean, about a mile, and have such a good, excellent following field of view that you're going to be able to keep him in your crosshairs, number one. It's just the facts don't pan out. But nonetheless, COB said it. It was golden word. Kevin Poston's life was ruined forever. So Kevin was sent to He the was RPF already on the RPF was when this came up. Because when he initially went to the RPF, RTC was sec checking him. It was nobody else. RTC was sec checking him. So RTC wanted to be the first to get to Kevin Poston's quote unquote crimes. And that's what resulted out of it was that Kevin Poston had COB in his crosshairs on the sniper rifle. And Kevin Poston thereafter was considered a type three. He uh, was a rock slammer. Um, and he required serious, serious, serious handling before, he, and he can never be trusted again. Well, that's just that's just tragic. The tragic that man. Something so innocent of uh, looking at people in binoculars gets turned in. You're trying to kill Cob when in fact that never happens. Yeah. And but you know, and this is this is something interesting that that and and I don't really understand i know drama david miscavige is surrounded by drama and there's a lot of drama in the church uh drama is redefined in the church <laughs> oh i think i think it's up engineered into outright uh, histrionics and hysteria yeah hysteria is more like it. drama is 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 pretty mild that's that's being able to laugh or in hysteria you don't laugh there's this straight sternness and misery Point well taken. Well, as we say, yeah, as uh, Hubbard wrote, Scientology is a deadly, serious activity. I have, ex you know, I, when I, I analyze the Church of Scientology, there does seem to be a lot of unnecessary hysteria at the top. And as you point out, there's no humor in it oh, no. Whatsoever. Not whatsoever. Oh, my God. So in context, you know, there's a fire and then the binocular incident. So this gets highly up engineered into hysterical, deadly, serious threat. Yes. It was something strange kind of jumping around in the time sequence. The um, <clears throat> Later on, David Miscavige has uh, the, was it Building 50, the RTC building? Yeah. It, uh, you know, whatever, $50, 70000000 million to build. Uh, on Tony Ortega's blog, there were pictures where he has bulletproof glass in that building. Yes. It can withstand a fifty caliber, I guess, and... And yet, there's a. You see these pictures. There's a patio in which he goes out to smoke cigarettes. Yeah. And this doesn't make sense. If you're worried about a sniper, why do you walk into an open patio to smoke cigarettes? It sort of defeats the purpose of the glass. Well, yeah. But, I mean. <laughs> but it's a mixed message. It shows that he wants to convey the impression that he needs bulletproof glass, but yet he, you know. Out at the base, there's not really a threat because if you were serious, you would just stay inside your office and smoke because it's your office and nobody would care if well, you smoked and you're in charge anyway. You know, Jeff, I want to use your example there as an example to a, a, a scenario that keeps unfolding itself. See, you can assume that, Jeff, um, that, that yes. number one, that displays the psycho psychosis logic behind Dave. I mean, why would – why would you spend all this money to, bullet, to secure yourself and protect yourself, but then just on the other side of it, you establish a facility, a paradise, you know, as he put it up there, 
to where you can have picnics and barbecues and stuff. Basically, a patio for which him to go out and relax and have all this established furniture and a sound system and all that. But you know, there, there's a lot that gets assumed um, because of the obvious. Now, I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense as to why it was established, but using that example as an example, Jeff, there, there's a lot of assumption that goes on outside of what what really does happen as a matter of fact. Um, uh, now, wh why, why that building has bulletproof glass on it? Now, for years, it was always of a concern not only just on Dave's behalf to protect himself, but as part of my responsibility as a security chief, I've got to protect my people. So I have, uh, not that anybody else was more or less important from one from the other in my eyes. Uh, uh, I knew that Dave as being the head of the church uh, and also uh, the other execs, such as the inspector generals, those people are going to be of the utmost concern. If something was going to happen, that's where it was going to be focused at. It wasn't going to be focused towards the program writer up in Seamoyant or the, 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 lawn, the, the, the guy who cuts the grass. I have to ultimately provide an environment to protect key people. So efforts were put in on our behalf and designed into that building. And I was, I had, I was part of the, uh, uh, I guess you want to say, the designing aspect of that building initially in that the plans were sent to me for me to give my security input and design. So Karsten and I sat down and we reviewed all the plans. And initially, there was no um, concern for that. So that's kind of where the, the grassroots sprung from having um, bulletproof glass established in the building, only on certain glass, certain windows. Now, Dave himself, when he would get that, he most likely, and this is an educated assumption, a very well educated assumption in that Dave most likely would have the whole building have bulletproof glass because he could be anywhere in the whole building. Not because he wanted to protect his staff, it was because he could be anywhere in the building. So I'm I'm using your example, Jeff, to see to to kind of help educate the listening public that a lot gets assumed by the story such as myself and Amy and Mike and Mark and Marty and Sinar and anybody else who would actually walk the walk who had been there, they, they grows into these things, such as the, the, the razor wire on the fence. I mean, holy bejesus, another prime example of that, that ultra berry was pur purposely put there as a low profile but highly effective um, self-defense device. And it, it wasn't put in to give what is now grown into this sense of razor wire up on the fences. I mean, come on, folks. Anybody who's trying to protect an investment in life is going to seek out devices and tools to properly protect themselves. Well, there's millions of dollars to be protected, and there was what was regarded as the, the saviors of planet Earth um, behind these fences, and we're going to put in place what's necessary. So, Jackson, you make a you make an excellent point, and this is one reason I, I'm doing Surviving Scientology Radio. I want to separate fact from fiction by interviewing people who were actually there. So we, I very much appreciate your insight into that. What I'd like to do is end this as part one and uh, pick it right back up in part two in this very fascinating interview. If that's okay. Oh, uh, sure. You. Whatever you need, my friend. Great. Uh, love listening to your stories. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com or on YouTube. Just type in Surviving Scientology. In our next episode, we'll continue part two with Jackson Moorhead, former security chief of Scientology's Int Base. Uh, for Surviving Scientology Radio, thank you for listening. But Jackson, this is